Okay. <clears throat> so, one last class period of uh, covering the uh, preparatory things for as far as eigenvalues and eigenvectors are concerned. And then starting on uh, Tuesday, I'll, I'll start covering various methods for computing uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, the focus for today um, for Bayesian theory is about how sensitive um, the problem of computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors is. And it turned out it's actually a different story for eigenvalues and as opposed to eigenvectors when it comes to sensitivity. And by that, I mean, if um, if a matrix A was to change, how much could that change? Um, how, how much does that affect uh, the perturbed matrix? Matrixes, uh, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. Um, how how much do we change in re in response to a change in A? Um, so it's similar to when we looked at the uh, uh, problem of sensitivity, uh, the sensitivity of a problem um, A x equals B. Uh, so for that problem, excuse me. For that problem. We uh, derived a condition number, uh, so the condition number of A being norm of A times the norm of A inverse. Um, now that condition number is specifically for sensitivity sensitivity of a problem A x equals B. So that particular sensitivity measure is not going to help us here. Um, but the idea is the same. We want to try to see gauge uh, change in output um, relative to change in input. Okay. Now. <laughs> One uh, theorem of interest is called the uh, Gershgorin circle theorem. So what the um, Gershgorin circle theorem says is that um, if we consider the disks that are defined by uh, having centers at the diagonal entries of A and a radii come from summing up the absolute values of all the off diagonal entries in each row, um, so, for instance, uh, one of the disks would have a center at A11, and then we add up the absolute values of all the other elements in that, that row, in, in row one, and that gives us the, the radius. So, if we um, take a union of all of those disks, then we can say that the uh, all of the eigenvalues fall within that union. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that each one of these disks contains an eigenvalue. So we have to be careful about what this theorem does and does not say. Um, but for instance, if the matrix is uh, nearly uh, 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 nearly triangular, or nearly diagonal, um, it could give us a good, uh, could give us some good estimates of, of, of the eigenvalues. So, so here we have a matrix as an example that happens to have uh, real eigenvalues given here. So then um, what we do is for the first, um, for the first row, um, sorry, I have these out of order. Um, so, he, okay, I guess I, I guess I chose my centers corresponding to um, what are closest to, to each eigenvalue. So, I, sh I should really rearrange these, but anyway, th this this uh, Gershgorn disk comes from the uh, third row. The uh, diagonal entry of seven defines the center, and we add up the absolute values of all the other entries in that row, of one and a three, and that gives us a radius of four. Um, then a D2 is for the uh, second row, so we have uh, centers a diagonal entry of two, and then we have the... Uh, um, some of the absolute values of the off diagonal entries, two and one, and it gives us a radius of three. And then finally, from a, coming from a first row, we have uh, centers coming from a diagonal entry of minus five. So we have Z plus five here in absolute value. And then we add up the absolute values of the other entries in the first row, and that gives us a radius of two. So if we were to visualize the union of all three of these disks, um, we could say that the eigenvalue, we can conclude the eigenvalues uh, lie within that shape or, or shapes. Huh. 
Um, in this particular example, um, each disk contains one eigenvalue, as we can see that from the um, actual eigenvalues being fairly close to the diagonal entries, but it doesn't always, it's not always the case. Um, so I want to emphasize. And uh, I should point out, even if they the disks happen to be destroyed, um, it's still not a guarantee that each disk is going to contain an eigenvalue. You may have a certain disk containing more than one. And um, of course, the eigenvalues can fall in a complex plane, even if even if A is real. So, and this is um, so as the centers of these disks happen to be real, just because the matrix is real, but um, these defined disks in a complex plane. <clears throat> okay, so that's one. Um, concept of, of, of uh, sensitivity that uh, suppose you have a diagonal matrix, in which case the eigenvalues are known. <clears throat> if those diagonal entries change, or or, or if uh, matrix is perturbed in such a way that it's no longer diagonal, um, whatever off diagonal entries are introduced gives us an idea of how much the eigenvalues can change because they will give our, because those will define the radii of the disks. <clears throat> If you have a tridiagonal matrix, for instance, um, then those entries in the first uh, subdiagonal, superdiagonal, give you an idea as to how far the eigenvalues can wander away from a diagonal. <clears throat> yeah. Now, as I mentioned, the condition number of a matrix for the purpose of solving AX equals B, so norm of A times norm of A inverse, um, it doesn't apply, that doesn't help us understand the sensitivity of the eigenvalue problem, but it would be nice to have something like that, some something we can we, we could try computing or, or at least estimating that could uh, quantify um, sensitivity. Um, this leads us to what is called the condition number of a uh, simple eigenvalue. Now, um, to refresh your memory from last time, a uh, simple eigenvalue, excuse me, is one that has uh, that, that, that that is the uh, simple root of a characteristic polynomial, meaning that it has multiplicity one. So, and um, recall that we had two notions of multiplicity for eigenvalues, uh, algebraic and geometric multiplicity. So, if they're both equal to if they're both equal to one, uh, then that's a that's a simple eigenvalue. So, we're going to focus for now on this case of a simple eigenvalue, and then we'll discuss uh, repeated eigenvalues after. <coughs> so. Um, so lambda is going to have an eigenvector x um, and a uh, left eigenvector uh, y. Now, because it's a simple eigenvalue, we know that uh, the rank of this matrix, the this matrix is not is not invertible or singular. It's singular due to the fact that lambda is an eigenvalue. <clears throat> so it's a, 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 that means it's not a full rank. But because it's a simple eigenvalue, we know that the rank is equal to um, n minus one, where a is a n by n matrix. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, uh, the left eigenvector happens to be a regular eigenvector of the Hermitian transpose. The eigenvalue would be uh, the complex conjugate of lambda. So, um, so that tells us that y is orthogonal um to the uh, uh range um okay. This, uh, 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 okay um all right um to clarify that 
Mm. <clears throat> like a, a point in general, because I don't think I've had to make this point in this class before. Um, okay. Range of a matrix A is the orthogonal complement of a null space of the um, Hermitian transpose. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, okay. So why? Um, I'll put up the equation here. Pressure, pressure memory is what it means to be a left eigenvector. Dang it. Y H A is equal to lambda Y H. Okay. All right. Um, and then I can use that down here. That we have, um, that we have this right here. Okay. Um, so, so taking this <clears throat> this equation down here, y is in the null space of the uh, Hermitian transpose of a minus lambda identity. Um, so that means it's orthogonal to the range of a minus lambda identity. Um, so, so that leads us to this, that the orthogonal complement of a range, which is the null space of a transpose, which is the null space of this, it's just the Hermitian transpose worked out, that's why. <clears throat> or the, all, the, sub, the subspace consisting of all multiples of y. Now, um, <clears throat> the reason why this is important is um, X um, okay. Not the null space of a minus lambda identity consists of all multiples of, of x. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, all of these notifications are distracting me and driving me crazy. I need to shut this app down. I mean, that's a deadline that today's the last day to submit some, some gra application to graduate for a certain semester. Apparently, everybody's doing that all at once. Okay. That's, okay. Now, sorry. Okay, so so what, what we're getting from this is that it's not possible for y to be orthogonal to x, because if uh, if y was orthogonal to x, then um, then X would belong to this space, uh, which is not possible because uh, X, X belongs to the, the, the null space. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, of, of A minus lambda identity. So the upshot of going through all of this is to show that this inner product of Y and X is non-zero. Um, and because of it being non-zero, we can normalize X and Y so that this inner product is actually equal to one. 
but we, we needed to s- establish a non or functionality before we could do that. Now, um, now we're going to assume that a lambda and x um, are parameterized. So when epsilon is equal to zero, it's just the original a lambda and x. So a of epsilon, x of epsilon, lambda epsilon are the perturbed versions of uh, these these entities. So um, so x of epsilon is always an eigenvector of a of epsilon, and the corresponding eigenvalue is lambda of epsilon. OK, and uh, we'll assume that the perturbed A has this form that we're adding on some uh, given matrix um, F scaled by epsilon, and we'll assume that uh, F has a, a two norm of one. <clears throat> so then what we do is we take this equation and take the derivative with respect to epsilon, and then we substitute epsilon equals zero throughout. And uh, from taking that derivative, um, this is what we get. Okay. And then what we do is take the inner product of both sides of this equation with uh, y. I should say, actually taking the inner product of y, not yh, because taking inner product with y means multiplying on the left by yh. And uh, <clears throat> now I have to make sure that uh, that's re- recorded in my list of mistakes. Dang it. Sorry, one 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 moment, please. Okay. Mm. All right, now, um, okay, so, so so now we're at this point, um, and we use the fact that um, y Hermitian transpose x is equal to one. Um, so now we can isolate what we're after, and that is the derivative of the eigenvalue um, with respect to epsilon and epsilon equals zero, because this is how we measure the sensitivity of, of lambda. <clears throat> Um, we have these two terms canceling. Um, so now we see that it's uh, this uh, bilinear form right here. Okay, so then we go ahead and um, get an upper bound for that. And here is where we're using the fact that the two norm of F is assumed to be one. So now we have uh, this. Um, now here's where we use the fact that the um, Cosine of an angle theta between two vectors is given by the inner, pro- inner product um, divided by the um, product of our, of our two norms. Um, but yhx is assumed to be one, so now we have that. Um, so now we have this formula for the sensitivity of a simple eigenvalue. It's one over the absolute value of a cosine of the angle uh, between them. So let's suppose that uh, x and y are parallel. Then um, the angle between them is zero, cosine of zero would be one. Um, so we have uh, one for a condition number. So that's the ideal situation. But if they're, uh, now x and y cannot be orthogonal, we've already established that. But if they're near orthogonal, that means that theta is nearly pi over two. Um, Cosine theta would be very small, so the uh, condition number would be large. So just like with AX equals B, we 
want a condition number to be small, but a condition number is uh, greater than or equal to one. Um, and we prefer not to have a, a large condition number. Yeah. All right. So now we have our measure of uh, condition number. Um, for formula for condition number. Are there any questions um, up to this point? OK, um, it's not clear if it actually used the assumption that lambda was a simple eigenvalue. How it came into play is that um, if lambda is a repeated eigenvalue, and if, if there's more than one linearly independent eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue, then um, we don't have a unique eigenvalue between the left and right eigenvector. Um, you actually have a subspace of dimension greater than one um, spanned by left eigenvectors and numbers multi-dimensional subspace for right eigenvectors, um, the angle between them therefore would not be well defined. So uh, condition, this condition number that we have here um, is only defined when lambda is a simple eigenvalue. <clears throat> so, so what does this tell us? That if we make an order epsilon perturbation in the matrix, then the eigenvalue is perturbed by this much. Um, and this could be a large amount if the uh, left and right eigenvectors for lambda are nearly orthogonal. Um, and another way to interpret the, this uh, condition number in a case where it's large, um, just as a condition number for AX equals B, being large means A is close to a singular matrix. Here, it means a large condition number means A is close to a matrix that has a, a multiple eigenvalue, uh, which can be problematic, especially if the eigenvalue is like defective. <clears throat> so as an example, um, here's a ran uh, random matrix A, um, and here's its eigenvalue, and here are the left and right eigenvectors uh, that go with it. Um, these are normalized. It's even, notice that we have pretty small numbers over here, pretty large numbers over here, but if you take the inner product of X and Y, you get one. Um, so, um, so if I work out the um, uh, the uh, uh, condition number, we get uh, this value. Um, so, nearly one hundred nine. So, um, because it's a somewhat large condition number, if that's not terribly large, but here we just change the matrix. You can see that the matrix B is fairly similar to. A, uh, pretty much just tweaked the last couple of decimal places in each entry. Um, but that's all it took to um, get a matrix that has a double eigenvalue. Uh, so here, this uh, we're focusing on the eigenvalue that is near to, um, and we find that A is close to a matrix that has a repeated eigenvalue of two. So all that was about simple eigenvalues. What about repeated eigenvalues? Um, I mentioned previously that the eigenvalues of a matrix are continuous functions of the entries of a matrix. That does not mean, however, that they are differentiable functions of the matrix entries. So focus on a simple example. Um, so here we have a matrix that has, a, um, that if epsilon was zero, would have a uh, repeated eigenvalue of one. So we go ahead and compute the characteristic polynomial, and then compute the eigenvalues. So they're very clustered around one. So now we'll take a derivative of this eigenvalue, both of them with respect to epsilon, and we get this. So before we were interested in a derivative 
of the eigenvalue with respect to um, epsilon at epsilon equals zero. Uh, but now that kind of derivative for this uh, eigenvalue lambda would be um, undefined. Okay. Now, uh, what we can say is that if you have um, um, if matrix A has a P by P Jordan block, um, so this happens if P is greater than one, that happens when um, the eigenvalue is defective. Um, then the sensitivity of that eigenvalue depends on the size of a Jordan block. So uh, order epsilon perturbation A leads to order epsilon one over P change in, in the eigenvalue. Um, so that means the, so the larger the Jordan block, in other words, the more defective the eigenvalue is, the more sensitive it's going to be to, uh, to uh, perturbations. So here we see we have a two by two Jordan block and um, here we have this epsilon to the, to the one half in here. Now that's consistent with what we're seeing here. <clears throat> um, and so that means that um, such eigenvalues are, 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 are more sensitive because we're raising epsilon to, meant to be a small number, raising it to a, a, a smaller power. <clears throat> That's the story on sensitivity of eigenvalues. What about sensitivity of eigenvectors? Okay. Um, now we're actually going to focus on not just eigenvectors, but invariant subspaces of a matrix. Um, as I mentioned before, if, it, if you take a surety composition uh, that's given right here, um, and I take the um, first several columns of Q, um, that's always going to be uh, to define an invariant subspace, which can be used to obtain eigenvectors. Okay. okay, so so we assume that we have our surety composition. Um, Q is a um, a unitary matrix. Uh, T is upper triangular, and we're going to assume that T has this uh, block structure of diagonal blocks T one one T two two that are upper triangular. And then we're going to decompose Q uh, in this column partition. So we have uh, Q1 consists of a first R columns of A, for, of Q, sorry, for, for some R. Um, and then this diagonal block at this associated Q1 is R by R. Uh, so then we'll have this other diagonal block is N minus R by N minus R. Um, this matrix has the uh, N minus R uh, orthogonal columns. <clears throat> so our sensitivity measure for the invariant subspace um, is, is, is this, that um, here we have, uh, so we try to find separation between these two diagonal blocks um, by this expression right here. Um, now T11 and T22 are generally going to be of different sizes. Um, so, in this case, the matrix X needs to have R columns because T11 is R by R, um, and it has to have N minus R rows because T22 is N minus R by N minus R. So, so we take a minimum over all non-zero uh, matrices that have um, R rows and N minus R columns. Um, and uh, and find, find find a minimum, and that gives us a separation uh, between uh, these two diagonal blocks. Um, okay. Now, um, reason why we have this measure of separation between these matrices is if you make the same kind of change in A as before, or epsilon perturbation in the entries of A, then the subspace is changed by this much, uh, meaning that if these subspaces, sorry, if, if these diagonal blocks are deemed to be closer together, um, then 
we have greater sensitivity because if if if, if T one one two 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 are close together in some sense, then um, SEP of T one one two 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 will be smaller. Um, so the size of a perturbation will be larger. <clears throat> now to make um, this notion of separation between these matrices more concrete, I'm going to step through an example uh, where we could let R be equal to one. Um, so Q1 actually uh, it's just a single eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. So T11 is just a number, it's just lambda. Uh, so then this block would be M minus one by M minus one. So in that case, we can get a handle on what, uh, how separated Lambda is from T22, uh, which uh, the eigenvalues of T22 are all the other eigenvalues of A. Okay, so we fill in T11 equal to Lambda. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the matrix X needs to have um, R rows and N minus R columns. Um, so what that means is, in this case, it needs to be a row vector. Um, so I'll describe it as a Y Hermitian transpose. Okay, so then um, I'm, and because this is now a vector, a Frobenius norm of a vector, is the same as the two norm of a vector because in either case, you're taking a square root of the sum of squares of all the absolute values of the entries. Um, and I can certainly uh, take a transpose of what's in here because it's still just going to be a vector. Um, but if I take the minimum of a two norm of a matrix times a vector over all unit vectors, um, then that's given by the smallest singular value of the matrix in question. Um, okay, so so how separated lambda is from T22 is equal to the small singular value of, of this matrix. <clears throat> but let's suppose that one of the eigenvalues of T22 is lambda. Then T22 minus lambda identity is a singular matrix, so the separation would be zero. Um, whereas if lambda was well separated from all the eigenvalues of T22, then this small singular, so this matrix is nowhere near singular, therefore this uh, separation will be large. Right, so, so, so this quantity, step of lambda of T22, tells us how far away lambda is from all of the other eigenvalues of A, which are the eigenvalues of T22. <clears throat> So, so remember I said that the um, invariant subspaces are more sensitive if this separation is small. So that means that if um, eigenvalues are clustered near one another, then their eigenvectors are going to be more sensitive to perturbation. Uh, whereas in this case, if, if, like if, if lambda is far away from the eigenvalues of T22, um, then this separation would be large, and we're dividing by that, so the sensitivity of the uh, eigenvectors would be less. Okay. All right, so, um, so what we see is eigenvalues, simple eigenvalues anyway, can be uh, um, sensitive if they're left and right eigenvectors are um, nearly orthogonal. Um, eigenvectors can be quite sensitive if their eigenvalues are closely clustered together. So, so the sensi sensitivity of each, I guess, eigen entity is dependent on properties of the other. Um, but what this means is um, that. Uh, just because if you know an eigenvalue to be sensitive, that doesn't necessarily mean that this corresponding eigenvector is also going to be sensitive. There, there's no direct relationship between the sensitivity of an eigenvalue and its corresponding eigenvector or corresponding invariant subspace. 
So you could have a situation where um, an eigenvalue is, is quite sensitive um, because its left and right eigenvectors are nearly orthogonal. Um, but if it's far away, if it's far away from other eigenvalues, then its eigenvector is insensitive. Um, similarly, you can have an eigenvalue that's very well conditioned, uh, but if it is very close to other eigenvalues, uh, regardless of its own well conditioning, its uh, eigenvectors could be quite sensitive to uh, perturbation. So it's, it's a more complicated picture of that sensitivity of a equals b because if a equals b, you just compute that one condition number, norm of a, norm of a inverse, and that tells you how sensitive it is. But um, here the, 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 the picture is murkier. And what we're going to see when it comes to uh, methods for computing eigenvalues, having eigenvalues closely clustered together uh, does prevent, present uh, substantial difficulty. Um, meanwhile, um, when you have left and right eigenvectors that are pretty much pointing in the same direction, or maybe they are exactly in the same direction, which happens if the matrix is normal, then uh, that makes things a lot nicer from a numerical stability standpoint. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, I see something in the chat here. Okay. Oh, that's from a while ago. Um, oh, I see one of y'all left. Um, okay, so um, I've actually come to the end of a note <laughs> for for today. Um, uh, so, questions about that or any homework problems? No, sir. OK. Um, well, then I guess we're calling it good and uh, power method coming on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. You too.